today. Thanks, Peter. Welcome, everyone. So our first speaker is uh, Scott Morrison, who will talk about uh, theorem provers for mathematicians. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's, um, it's great fun to be here uh, with everyone from, uh, from both schools uh, here to, to talk about this. So um, I'm coming to this whole subject of, of uh, interactive theorem proving or automatic theorem proving uh, as a mathematician, not as a computer scientist. So in some sense, I'm very much a, a user of these tools. And there are people out here in the audience, some from the computer science side, who are, who are much more expert in what's really going on than I am. And uh, my, my goal today is to first of all give you a flavor on what on earth this subject is and what it's for, uh, but also to be opinionated and uh, say a few things about what I think the, the prospects of this stuff is for mathematics uh, and what both mathematicians and computer scientists should be doing in the next couple of years to, to make this all work out as well as it possibly could. Okay, so I think I'm just going to start by jumping right in and assuming that uh, no one's got the faintest idea what a theorem prover is and showing you what a theorem prover is by using one. So don't read that slide. Um, let's uh, go here. Uh, we need a bigger font, clearly. Can, see, can people read that text by now? OK, we're going to prove something. Uh, and what we're going to try and prove is that there are infinitely many primes. So we're going to write a proof. Uh, the computer is going to be showing us what we need to do as we go along. At the end, it's going to verify that the proof we wrote really is correct. And hopefully, it's going to help us along the way and do some of the tedious work for us. OK, so uh, there are a few lines of junk at the beginning. We import something. We open something that's just sort of garbage. OK, so then the first interesting line is completely obvious. And I think everyone can read it. It says theorem. There are infinitely many primes. And then there's a statement written just as anyone would write it. For all natural numbers, well, I guess I left out all that it's a natural number. For all n, there's a p bigger than n so that p is prime. OK, that's the ob an obvious statement, that there are infinitely many primes. OK, and now we've got to give a proof. And what I've done is I've written a begin and an end. So that's just like in LaTeX, your slash begin proof slash end proof, just in a different language. And as soon as I put the cursor inside that begin end block, there's this display over on the right half of the screen where the computer is telling me what it thinks is going on. And so it's titled tactic state. And it says we've got, we've got one goal. And that goal is pretty much exactly the goal that we said we were setting up to prove. For all natural numbers n, there exists p a natural number and a proof which the computers decided to call h for us, I guess, a proof that p is greater than or equal to n, such that that number p is prime. OK? So uh, what do we do? Well, the very first thing we do as mathematicians, we would say, let n be a natural number. OK? And in, uh, in this particular theorem prover, we write that by writing intro n. And I'm going to click the cursor to the right of that line now. And what you'll see is that the goal will update. After I click to the right, now, on the first line, it says we've got some particular n a natural number, and our goal is to prove something about that particular natural number. The little blue symbol there before the exist symbol is called the turnstile, for people who haven't met that. Most mathematicians probably haven't. Uh, and it's meant to indicate what the, the goal uh, is. Any questions? Feel free to interrupt and heckle and complain and all that stuff. OK. OK. So what do we do next? Well, we've got to think at the moment and decide how we're going to actually prove this. So the strategy that I'd like to do is we'll take our number n, we'll compute n factorial, we'll add 1, we'll pick a prime factor of that number, and we'll see that that, that prime factor uh, do, does what we want. Okay? So what do we do? Well, we say let m be n factorial plus 1. Uh, so you, you do need to somehow know that fact is how this language expresses factorial. But as soon as we say that, we have a new hypothesis, m, which is defined as we, as we said. And then uh, we do another let. We let m be the minimum factor of that m. So again, you need to be able to look up what minfac is. But if I put the cursor over it, I do get a little helpful piece of text telling me what that function does. It takes a natural number and returns the smallest prime factor, assuming at least n isn't 1, in which case maybe its behavior is undefined. OK. So what do we need to do at this point? Well, we're going to want to have the assertion that that p really is prime. So let's do this. Let's write have pp colon prime p. So pp is sort of just naming this new hypothesis that p is prime. And we're just going to write sorry, which means I don't feel like proving this yet. Uh, maybe I'll come back to it later. It's a hole in my proof. 
Uh, and it's very important that you can write sorries in these things because you want to write the interesting stuff first, maybe the hard stuff that you're not sure how to prove yet, and come back later and fill in all of the easy stuff that obviously works once you've, once you've got confidence that the proof you're writing really is a, a good proof. Okay, so we leave a little gap there with the sorry. And now, uh, looking back at our goal, oh, let me put the cursor to the right. Once I put the cursor to the right there, I have this new fact amongst my hypotheses that P really is prime. Okay, uh, so we're meant to be proving an existential statement here, and we have the P that we're planning on using, so let's just write use P, which tells the computer, please satisfy this existential statement with the P that I wrote down. And once I do that, you'll see the existential statement changes. Now we just have to provide two things, the fact that P is greater than or equal to N, and the fact that P is prime. There are two things we have to do. So there's a convenient little tactic split, which says, I'd like to do these separately, please. If I put the cursor after split, you'll see the tactic state changes to showing us two goals, P is greater than or equal to N, and P is prime. And then you'll see on the lines below here, where I've introduced some curly braces, if I step inside one of those curly braces that says, I want to think about just the first goal and work on that one for now. P is greater than or equal to N. Okay. Well, again, we've got to pause and actually do some math. Uh, how do we prove that P is greater than or equal to N? Any suggestions? What should we do? Hopefully everyone agrees with the strategy that I have lined up here. <laughs> What's that? Add one. Add one. Oh, no, no, let's not do, let's not do any adding ones. Let, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's prove this by contradiction, okay? Let's assume, assume the opposite. So we'll write by contradiction. And moving the cursor over, we have a new hypothesis now. It is not the case that P is greater than or equal to N, and our new goal is to prove false. Now that goal, oh sorry, that hypothesis, it is not the case that P is greater than or equal to N, is a bit ridiculous. Uh, and so we should write, oops, oops. We should write simp at A, and that simplifies that hypothesis to the more reasonable looking P is less than or N, less than N, which is <coughs> what we might have thought should go there in the first place. Again, we need to stop and do some maths. What's our strategy for getting a contradiction here? Well, it's going to be some little divisibility argument. The idea is that we will show that P divides factorial N plus 1. Of course, it was chosen as a factor of factorial N plus 1. But P also divides N factorial, because P is smaller than N, and therefore it divides 1, and therefore everything goes wrong, okay? Because primes don't tend to divide 1. Uh, so let's assert those facts. We'll assert that P divides M, and for now we're just going to say sorry. I don't want to prove that. We'll assert that P divides factorial N, and again, say sorry. We'll assert that, as a consequence, P divides 1, and, uh, and well, maybe at this point we kind of feel like we're done. Like, it's pretty obvious from here, hey? Okay. So let's see if the computer can give us any help. We're going to go back through these sorries now, and, uh, uh, and write this. So, so now we're using a, a, a tactic. I mean, split and use and by contradiction rule tactics as well. But, but back here is meant to be a, a backwards reasoning tactic. It just goes out and finds lemmas that it already knows about, tries to see if any of them, any of their conclusions match the, the thing you're currently trying to prove. And if it does, it applies the lemma. Maybe that lemma itself had hypotheses, so then it tries again on those to see if it can solve those by applying lemmas or local hypotheses. And it just does something dumb and just keeps trying. It's doing a little tree search to see if it, to see if it can do it. And indeed it can. It, it manages to prove here that P was prime, and it even told us over on the right-hand side here the proof it found. And it's something about factorials being positive, and I guess the next step here is so this first fact here is going to tell us that the factorial is positive. This next fact presumably tells us that actually the factorial plus 1 is greater than or equal to 1. And then that next fact is going to tell us that factorial plus 1 is not equal to 1. And then finally that'll tell us that, that the minimum factor we pulled out really was a prime number. Okay, but the computer found that and we don't really need to pay attention. And so we keep... Uh, oops, come back to this window, hopefully. We keep sticking in by backwards reasoning and let it run for a little while while it thinks and it says sure I can cope with that I can prove all those little things for you and in fact if we want to we can then just actually copy and paste in 
uh, all of the proofs that it found of all of those facts. And again, uh, the computer says, yep, I'm happy. That really does constitute a proof. We're done. OK. So uh, any questions? <laughs> Everyone's happy. OK. So uh, maybe one or two things to say here. Uh, this proof that I showed you kind of hit about the right level in some sense. Like we said the things that you might expect to say to a human while giving this proof, and we didn't say the things that you might not expect to say. The computer did fill in a lot of the, the details that a human might say. Yeah, sure, I can do that too. I'm cheating a little bit here, actually. The backwards reasoner I showed you here uh, is not quite prime time for this, this particular theorem prover. And the one that I'm using in this example is kind of a little bit finely tuned for this particular problem. So, okay. Anyway, other more more other other theorem provers, and I'll talk about those in a moment, do this sort of thing themselves. But the one I showed you today is slightly deceptive. How long did it take you to do this the first time? Ah, um, you mean to to set up the scripts right here? Here you knew what to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, and I'll come to it. Um, the basic answer is that everything is hard and horrible, and it takes a really long time. <laughs> um, yeah, there are, some, there are some better and worse stories. Uh, for a proof like this, where the structure is pretty obvious and nothing too complicated is going on, to be honest, if you don't have a good backwards reasoner available that fills in easy things for you, you spend the majority of your time thinking, I need to use this fact here. Like, what does this fact even say here? It says something about if k divides m, then k divides n, if and only if k divides m plus n. Like, and you sit around thinking, surely someone's proved this before. It's in the library somewhere. And then you spend half an hour trying to find the damn result in the library. And all your time gets wasted doing that. There are tools that help you find these things. But yeah, it can, it can be tedious. OK, I'll come back to how hard it is to prove things and the time scales of things as we go. OK, so. Uh, in fact, actually, you can abbreviate that proof way, way down from what I actually just wrote. Uh, the, um, again, this is with a slightly tweaked backwards reasoner that maybe is a little bit unfair, but you can imagine writing a proof as short as this, where you just really give the very basic facts. I want to do it by contradiction, fill things in for me. OK. Um, proving there are infinitely many primes is boring. We've known how to do that for like going on 3,000 years now. Uh, uh, more than 2,000 years now. Um, so I just want to just throw up a little example here that I'll come back to later, um, which is from something much more recent this year. Um, but it's about maths that was only done in 2012. This is the, the, the definition. I mean, there's 10,000 lines that come before this that I'm not showing you, but this is the, the, uh, the peak moment of the definition where some people are defining what a perfectoid space is. And this is the stuff that Peter Schultz got a Fields Medal for last year. Like, it's, it's real 21st century mathematics. And you can do it in these systems. OK, we'll come back. OK, so I better tell you a little bit more about the variety of theorem provers out there. So there's lots of these. Uh, they, uh, they use a variety of different um, foundational axioms for doing mathematics. Uh, there are ones that work in, in zermelo frankel set theory, which is where mathematicians pretend that they work. Uh, there are ones based on high-order logic. There are ones based in dependent type theory. There are ones based in homotopy type theory. And when you pick a theorem prover to work in, typically you are picking a logic to work in, although some of the theorem provers are, let you plug in different logics as well. Uh, that said, I want to say that from the most mathematicians' point of view, it's all irrelevant, and the foundations don't matter very much. And very quickly, you're insulated from them. And except, well, I'll, I'll talk about the ways in which it matters. Um, I've never actually seen, as far as I'm aware, the axioms for zermelo frankel set theory on a piece of paper or on a board or something like that. Like, I'm aware I could find a book where I could read them. But I've spent a career doing mathematics not actually seeing the official foundations. And I just want to emphasize that you don't need to have any interest in foundations to do any of this stuff. OK. There are a bunch of different trade-offs uh, in making choices between different theorem-proving uh, languages. And I just sort of indicated a few of the maybe directions in here. Uh, so there's, there's sort of how much it feels like you're working in some arcane programming language versus how much you're writing in some, something like mathematical English. Uh, 
Uh, and maybe the language I showed you a moment ago is kind of somewhere in the middle in the possibilities that, that, of the choices that are out there at the moment. There's an idea of whether they're focused on doing mathematics or focused on doing programming, and there's a big spread amongst the available theorem provers there. I mean, a huge purpose of, of all of this um, interactive and automatic theorem proving is, of course, to verify the behavior of software, to see that it does what it's meant to, meant to, meant to do. Uh, I'm a mathematician, so I don't care so much about whether my software works. Um, <laughs> and, so, uh, and, so, uh, and so you're making choices in when you choose a language about the priorities between mathematics and programming. Uh, and then there's also this, this very important uh, choice it's not, I mean, on all of these axes, there's not necessarily a trade off. You, you, sometimes you can have everything. You want to have everything, maybe. Uh, but there's, a, there's this axis of automation and interaction. And so the idea, an interactive theorem prover, is more like the first half of that little demo that I gave, where we were writing the proof ourselves and telling the computer every step. And the automatic side is more like the second step, where we filled in back everywhere and had the computer fill out low level stuff. But you're always going to expect some trade off where hopefully the human explains the big ideas, the computer does the tedious stuff, and you'd like that line in between to be as high as possible. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, and then there are lots of these things. The computer scientists have given us these marvelous, marvelous gifts, and mathematicians are barely using them. And if you count mathematicians to exclude all the mathematicians who work in computer science departments, of which there are many, mathematicians are essentially not using them. So just as some examples to mention, uh, there's Isabel, which comes in a few varieties, but Isabel Hull is something that's very popular here over in your guys' side of the, the building. Um, there are Lean and Coq, which are two closely related, related languages, uh, one a bit older, one a bit newer, uh, which um, Lean is, is the one I showed you a moment ago, the one I'm, I'm keen on at the moment. And then a bunch of other things. Agda is popular. There are things like Liquid Haskell, which is more of on the programming side. Uh, of things, uh, and I just wanted to mention, just to indicate there are tons of these things, Arend was some new one announced like last week that came out. So there's, there's different different systems with different histories and different, they're, they're ready for use to different degrees. Any questions? If you don't ask questions, I'm probably going to run short on time, but I guess then we can have the wine and cheese faster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how do things like SMP solves the Z3 is the big one. Yeah, yeah. I'm from industry and I see this a bit more. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I know that's not a theorem prover in quite the same way, but how does it just fit into that universe? Yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, in some sense, sort of. What was the question? Oh, so there are these things called SMT solvers. Okay, an even simpler thing is maybe there are SAT solvers. So uh, a SAT solver is just something where you hand it some giant Boolean expression, lots of ands and ors, and lots of Boolean variables, and say, Find me an assignment of the variables that makes it true, okay? And I mean, SAT is famously, officially a difficult problem uh, in the sort of computational complexity version of things, but in practice, it's actually kind of tractable. I mean, the, the, as in terms of the algorithms people have that run on real world problems, it runs really well. And, uh, and then SMT is sort of a, I mean, think of it as some sort of decoration of SAT. I mean, you're, you're, allowed, you're allowed to introduce your own symbols and, and rather than just rounding on. It's, but yeah, but in some sense, I, no, I want to include SMT solvers in this chart. They get sort of way over on this end of the scheme. You tell it nothing except your, your problem. And uh, maybe their, their application so far has all been sort of in this direction, They're primarily used in like, uh, in either in, in uh, I mean, compilers verifying that what they're doing is really a correct implementation of the code of the human road and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I believe is used in um, type checking of liquid Haskell. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, absolutely, sort of these systems that are sort of more at the mathematics, natural language, sort of interaction sort of end of, of this scheme, you hope that under the hood, they've got a fantastic SMT solver plugged in there, which brilliant computer scientists and engineers have provided for you, but that maybe you don't notice as a mathematician, <laughs> except that easy, easy stuff gets done for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, they're meant to be part of this. Okay, so why? Why should mathematicians care about interactive or automatic theorem provers? 
Uh, and I mean, this why is really, a, I mean, even though you, lots of computer scientists are here, this why is really addressed sort of back internally to the mathematicians. Uh, why should mathematicians care and pay attention to the, all this stuff that computer scientists have been doing? And I, I generally hear sort of three different answers which you can, you can like or loathe. Uh, so you'll certainly hear people say things like, oh, there's a, there's a crisis in mathematics. The, Proofs don't get checked. Okay, that's certainly true. I mean, proofs don't get checked in the refereeing process. Um, there, are, there are problems in the literature that there are just gaps that papers never end up getting published or things go missing and uh, people cite forward into the future and then those papers never come. And I think all the mathematicians in the room, I mean, could, I, mean I, I bet I could pick any mathematician in the room and they could tell me their favorite example from their field of a, some giant gap in the literature like that. Okay, so it's there. And maybe you can even sort of tisk 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 at your colleagues in other areas of maths and say, oh, your standards of rigor are getting pretty shady by now. Um, um, I hope my um, Okay, so you could say all of those things. And I'm, I'm roughly, personally, I'm not actually that convinced that these are, while these are relevant and true things, I'm not sure they're actually sensible motivations to get interested in interactive and automatic. I mean, if anything, maybe this is sort of a joke, but like, uh, if we wanted to like referee papers by having them formalized, the purpose wouldn't be to be more confident in the results. The pur purpose would be to, to be to discourage there being so many mathematics papers, of which there are clearly too many. <laughs> and if we like concentrated our effort on doing the important stuff well, including verifying everything, then uh, we'd all be better off. Anyway, um, okay. There's, a, there's, there's this idea that maybe you get a deeper understanding of the mathematics through the process of teaching it to the computer. And I think this is absolutely true. Um, I mean, I think everything I've sat down to try to formalize so far, I've realized halfway through, huh, OK, I didn't understand that aspect of the subject that I have been teaching for years and all of that stuff. Um, the computer, I mean, the computer is a, is a, is a vicious pedant who sometimes is really annoying, but it's really, really good at pointing out what you don't understand. But I think the, the real one that I want to advertise is, is that it will make us all better mathematicians. And this is maybe an ambitious claim. But certainly, I think, for many mathematicians, pure and, uh, and applied, um, computer algebra systems over the last couple of decades have clearly made us better mathematicians. Okay? Uh, you can go do big simulations in, in, on the applied side. You can go do big classification problems and search problems and investigating examples and counterexamples all across the pure side. And we're just genuinely better for having these tool, tools available. And I think you should think of interactive theorem proving as sort of providing this sort of advantage. You'll, I mean, the dream is you tell the computer, like, oh, like, surely if we just sort of try some induction argument on one of those parameters there, and it says, oh, yeah, yeah that works. <laughs> wow, OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, so to, to make any of that work, to have theorem provers be helpful uh, for, for working mathematicians, there's going to be, need to be very strong automation. But at the same time, uh, we're going to need to understand what it's doing. And when it fails, hopefully we're going to have to understand why it failed or gain some insight from why it failed. And so unlike a SAT solver, which just says yes or no or runs for years, uh, we'd, we'd like to have some communication uh, back, from the, back from the systems. OK, so why not uh, use interactive theorem proof? Well, one scary thing is that the mathematics you do may go obsolete. I mean, books don't go obsolete for the most part. You can still read them 100 years later. Uh, but at the moment, at least, there's a big problem that there are lots of different theorem provers. They make different choices about foundations and about levels of automation and all these things. And if you commit to doing mathematics in one, and that one dies, the community fades away, something like that, all that mathematics is locked there. It's a big problem, and people care about it, working out how to transport mathematics that has been taught to one computer system in one logic and one language and so on to other, to other systems. But uh, it seems like the computer scientists are still struggling on that one. It's early days. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And so there's a big risk here of putting effort into, into, found it, into systems that die. But then the big, big reason to not do this is it's really hard, okay? It genuinely, I mean, I, I showed you this, this cheap trick example where I was using the, 
the undo buffer of my editor to, to write it quickly in a couple of minutes. But yeah, it takes a very long time. And mostly the reason is that the computer is obtuse. And, and I mean, it really wants to see every detail. And sometimes uh, it can be a struggle to even just pack the like find the lemmas out there rather than rewriting everything to yourself every time. Okay. But there are a few there are a few big things that I that are kind of that make it that make things hard. So I didn't talk about so far um, type theories uh, and and the distinctions between different type theories. Um, <coughs> so let me. When should I wrap up? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So very quickly, um, many of these systems use use type theories, not set theory, which basically has the idea that uh, everything you ever talk about has some predeclared type at the beginning of time, and the computer knows that, and, and uh, it's not like you can reason about something being an element of this type or of that type. It just is of some type in the beginning, and this is useful because mathematicians do think this way. Uh, in some form of type theory, uh, unlike in ZFC, where everything is just a set. But uh, the the big distinction maybe in type theories are between sort of simple type theories, or well, I don't know this stuff, but I think the distinction is between between simple type theories and dependent type theories. And the idea of de independent type theory is you're allowed to make up types which depend on other things. Okay, so a very very simple example would just be something like you might write. Uh, something like uh, uh, vector uh, three natural numbers. And this is meant to be telling us about some type that consists of, of vectors, consistent with these elements of natural numbers, but with some prescribed length to me. Okay? So here this overall type depends on two things, some other type, the natural numbers, and that's generally okay. Uh, but then it also depends on a particular natural number. And this is the sort of thing that dependent type theory lets you do, and some other type theories don't let you do. Uh, great. Mathematicians think in dependent type theory all the time, even if they've never heard the word. Uh, if you look at any definition in any math book, it's, it's full of dependent types. Uh, but there's a giant trade off. So uh, the problem when you work in dependent type theory is that uh, often what will go on is you're talking about some expression that's in some type that depends on some parameters. And now you want to say, oh, actually, that's equal to something in that, that type itself is equal to some other type. But you've got some long hidden chain of dependencies through other types. And somewhere down that long, complicated chain of dependencies, the computer can't see that this was equal to that. And usually, all of those complicated dependencies are kind of hidden from you and you don't notice, except when they rear their head and you can't convince the computer of something. And it's because of some long chain of type dependencies. So it's a big problem in dependent type systems. Um, I should have, sorry, I should have prepared a, a clear example of how painful that gets. On the other hand, when you work in, in systems that do not allow dependent types and you don't have this sort of dependent type theory help, you do find yourself doing somewhat unnatural things. And a, a simple example of a dependent type might just be uh, the tangent space of some manifold at some point. Okay, so x is a point in the manifold, and this is meant to represent a type of vectors at that point, depending on, on the x there. And if you read, um, there was a recent paper about sort of doing smooth manifolds and so on in one of these theorem provers that did not allow dependent type theory. And you can see them struggling. They have to do artificial things that to look alien to mathematicians in order to cope with not being a dependent type system. You find them saying weird things like, well, like when we talk about the sphere Sn, this n here is like, it's not a natural number like all the other natural numbers we talk about. And like, we can't do arithmetic with it. And like, what are you doing? Crazy. Okay, so there are, there are trade-offs. Dependent type theory fits mathematicians' intuitions very well, but sometimes becomes painful. The simple type theories often allow faster programs and 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 proofs that don't suddenly go bad on you. Uh, but you have to jump through hoops and work in ways that feel kind of strange. And then the third thing I wanted to point up here is this 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 idea of transport of structure. So to mathematicians, if I tell you uh, okay, so here's the definition of a, of a local ring, okay, and I, and I write down the definition of a local ring, which takes a few axioms. And now I tell you I have two rings, R and S, which are isomorphic, okay? And R is a local ring. And I ask you, is S a local ring, okay? The mathematicians will all kind of stare at me like I've gone a bit batty, like, of course S is a local ring. They're isomorphic rings. How could they not 
both be local if one is local. But the computer just doesn't understand this, okay? And the, the general idea of, of, uh, of sort of taking, taking isomorphisms or equivalences or whatever and taking stuff you know about one side and moving it over to the other side is unfortunately painful. Uh, I mean, of course, secretly the mathematicians have done something. Like they checked when they wrote down the definition of local ring that they were only working in the language of rings to say their, their definition. Okay? But it's all surprisingly awful to, paint, to, to formalize and make those arguments work. Now, the, the Faustian bargain you can make here is that you can decide to go work in homotopy type theory, which is some newfangled, fancier version of dependent type theory that introduces lots of nice ideas from, uh, from homotopy theory. And there, they just kind of magic this problem away. Like when they have equivalences, they, they just say, oh, yeah, they're, they're like, the axioms just make them equal and let you move things across. And it's wonderful and feels great. Um, but uh, you've also given yourself this sort of straitjacket. You, the language has constrained you to only say things which are homotopy invariant. And of course, maths is mostly not homotopy invariant. And so you have to like fight to work out how to say your non homotopy invariant things in this language that is constrained to homotopy theory. So it's a trade-off that's maybe mostly a bad idea. Anyway, okay, the homotopy type theorists will hate me, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's fine. Some things are, we've got reasons and things we're worried if it's hard, but maybe things are too hard. So let me very, very quickly give you some examples. So what's been done in terms of like big, convincing, impressive bits of mathematics? In, in, uh, in these theorem bridges. So you can, at the top of the three examples that everyone usually gives. So there was a, 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 a verified proof of the four color theorem. And the four color theorem comes down to this huge case bash at the end. And so what they did is they, they wrote an algorithm that does the case bash, verified that the algorithm did what it said on the box, and then ran the algorithm on lots of cases. Uh, similarly, the Kepler conjecture, which is this one about stacking oranges at the greengrocer, and that the greengrocers are doing it right, um, again, has a giant case bash and a verified algorithm that does the case bash. Okay, and you can see both of those have pretty big gaps. I've written dates next to them. The leftmost date is when the mathematicians did it, and the rightmost date is when things got got formalized and done in the computer. And there are some there are some large spreads there. Then there's the odd order theorem. Uh, every finite group of odd order is solvable, which was a famous and interesting example in maths because. Uh, it was huge. It was the first big proof in finite group theory. Like the original paper is 200 pages, and apparently it's kind of dense and, and uh, leaves out lots of steps in some senses. Uh, and so that was formalized, uh, again, a, a fair while later. But I think in some ways it's not that impressive an example, because it's one of these proofs that is massive but not very deep. Okay? It's really, really huge, but maybe at the end of the day you could argue that every step or the technology involved in every step you could teach to our good undergrads here, like just character theory and some stuff, like relatively elementary facts, but just a lot of it. Yeah? Okay. The finite group theorists maybe will be grumpy, but uh, fine. Okay. So something I think interesting that's happened just in the last couple of years, or this year, uh, is um, some, some of the mathematicians who've recently started using these systems decided, well, we better check if it is actually possible to do modern mathematics in these systems. Maybe it's not. Maybe things just bog down before you get there. And so the thing that they set out to do was to give this definition of a perfectoid space. So again, this is Fields Middle work from a, I mean, the first paper about this stuff I think is 2012. Okay, and the formalization, merely of the definition and one example, the empty perfectoid space, um, <laughs> was finished just recently. Uh, so what what these guys did is only a tiny fraction of what you really want to do. You want to you want to I mean. You, you ought to prove Schultz's theorems as well, okay? And they only did a tiny, tiny fraction of that. But nevertheless, even the definition itself is serious stuff. I mean, as Jim actually said to me a little while ago when I asked him about this stuff, he, he characterized it as, yeah, there's almost certainly no one in Australia who understands this definition, <laughs> let alone getting onto the theorems. So, I mean, it, it really is, like it's got, well, let's, here we go. Okay, oh, it's hard to read a little, but, um, Here's some fragments of their definition. And it's got all sorts of stuff. It's got some, it's, it's got lots of number theory. There's all this piadic stuff in it. There's some analysis. You need all this stuff about normed groups and valuations. It's mostly for the sake of piadic analysis, but anyway, it really is analysis. It's got a bunch of, um, it's got a bunch of algebraic geometry in it. You need to know about sheaves and schemes and various things like that, even to set up the definitions, okay? So it's, even the definitions are, are like, 
pretty close to the kind of conceptually most complicated thing that mathematicians do these days. Okay? And you can do it. Turns out it works. Okay? So these systems, these systems genuinely are ready to talk about, about sort of these arbitrarily, well, not arbitrarily, but as, as arbitrarily bounded by human capacity things. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to show you a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Like when you say you can do it, what's the? Oh well, I mean, so the, so this is this is an example where we're way on the interaction side and very little on the automation side. Basically, all that we've done is we've told it the definition, and it has agreed. Yes, that makes sense. I mean, it's a definition that's complicated. I mean, it has the, their work has hundreds of theorems in it to even write the definition down at the end. Okay, uh, and they proved all those theorems on the way. I mean, getting to the definition. I mean. Involves involves a ton of a ton of work, um, but yeah, I mean, like the definition is here. Like, I mean, it's a a perfectoid space is a a complete locally valued ringed space such that every what is it every every point in the space has some open cover which is isomorphic to this strange spectrum notion that's appropriate for perfectoid rings. And off you go. Um, okay. So I wanted to very quickly just show you some examples of kind of the difference between sort of uh, what automation gets for you. And I know I'm basically out of time, but let me do it very quickly. Uh, so the Uneda lemma. Let's just pretend everyone knows what the Uneda lemma is. Uh, where is it? OK. Uh, here's like 20 pages of someone proving the Uneda lemma in some other language, which I won't name. Um, and then. Uh, here are a few attempts at defining the UNEDA embedding. And so here's me writing down the UNEDA functor. It takes a functor and maps it into presheaves. It takes a category and maps it into presheaves on that category. And here I've just written down explicitly what it does on objects, what it does on morphisms. Those things are themselves functors, so what they do on objects and morphisms. Everything involved are functors on actual transformations. So there's a bunch of things I need to check about the functors actually being functorial, and the natural transformations actually being natural. And I just sit down and write, OK? And so that's this block here. And then I have another version where uh, this is just the same definition again, but I give fewer of the proofs and let the computer fill in more of the proofs itself, just doing really easy things, like just using arguments like, well, you can check these things component-wise, so let's check them component-wise. And If there's a simplifying lemma that applies, try simplifying and seeing if the equality holds now. And then there's a fancier version here where I've given no proofs at all and we're using a neat tool that um, Keely, who's in the audience, uh, uh, wrote with me that does like this cool heuristics of like searching through equational rewrites and finding good ones using kind of sort of human-like heuristics to direct doing the, uh, the rewriting. And here we've got a definition of the UNEDA functor with no proofs at all. We really just give the data, like what the UNEDA embedding actually does. Okay. Uh, and then there's this fantastic version at the end where we just give it a clue. We just tell it what it does on objects, okay, and leave it to work out by following its nose in a kind of sense that mathematicians understand well what it does on morphisms and what morphisms do on objects and all the rest of the stuff. Because all that following your nose stuff is just realizing, oh, the identity morphism would do here. Or, oh, I could compose those two morphisms. And the computer tries these things and then checks if we can prove the resulting obligations, and it does. So it comes back and lets you write the, the, the 10 character version of your data. And then finally here, there's like a, a three line, well, one line to give the statement of the UNEDA lemma, and then two lines to actually give the, what the UNEDA lemma does, like the constructive part of the UNEDA lemma. And then the 20 pages that I briefly flicked over <laughs> from some other language from 20 years ago, just don't need to be done, because the automation fills it all in, okay? Again, this is a little bit of a cheap example, a lot of the automation was written to polish this example to a beautiful knob. But anyway, there, you, there we go. Okay. Um, I better, yes? Um, yeah, yeah, it just said what it did on object. It sends an object to the home yeah, space. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, one, one way to do it is then, I mean, this file is not actually set up that way. But you could then just try and, because this is just the UNEDA embedding itself, then obviously 
15 months later, we want to prove you made a lemur without that information. Because surely you're going to go wrong with the information you get. But also, we can ask it. I mean, we can just, we can just print this statement out. You want to do what it's granted. But also, the theorem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so the exa I mean, this example I've shown you, obviously, no new proofs involved. Yeah, this is this is however many years old by now. Um, but um, no, I mean, the idea is some of both. I mean, the idea here is to show an example where we've got the automation good enough that none of the tedious stuff that a human wouldn't bother checking needs to be checked, thereby hopefully freeing up the human to be able to write the big steps of the proof and not think, this is horrible, I need to write all these, these details. But yeah, um, there, are, I mean, there are not a lot of examples to point out so far of people doing new maths with one of these environments as their main working tool, okay? Probably maybe no examples of that, okay? The goal is to get there, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the idea is you write the high level steps of the proof. Uh, I mean, as we were doing it for the prime number thing, so do induction now, or it better be by contradiction now. And then you call tactics that ask the computer, please try and finish from here for me. And so it is this interactive process where you, you give it ideas and then ask it for help. Okay, I better finish. I better finish. I better finish. There's my last slide. Um, green stuff is good stuff. Red stuff is worrying stuff. Um, their idea, their, I could show you some examples if anyone wants to see it, of people already using these theorem provers as aids in teaching. You're not asking the, compu the, the students to learn these languages, but you're using these languages to give them to show them interactive steps in a proof so that they can follow a proof more easily by having the computer be able to tell them what happened during the step in the proof. Students are already using these tools. I have some examples like the Reese representation theory, Conway's combinatorial game, CW complexes, braid groups are all things that ANU math students have done recently. There are some very initial examples of like real math papers that do use these tools to at least check lemmas, if not the big theorems. Some bad, scary things. There's a lot of work to just do all of math in these systems. As an example, Lean has an Ethereum rings, but doesn't know about holomorphic functions. In fact, I was telling this to James just recently, the definition of a finite dimensional vector space in Lean at the moment uh, is a Ethereum module over a field, which feels a little bit too much like Bulbaki for my taste, but anyway, uh, there are reasons to do things in maximum generality when you do this stuff. Okay, and then finally, we need way, way more good automation. The computer science has provided it with lots already. We need more, and we need more that interacts with humans well. But there's tons of low-hanging fruit and easy things to do, and there's, I mean, there's plenty of room there. So great, this is a good subject for mathematicians and computer scientists and computers and logicians and linguists and so on all to get together and do some stuff and maybe hopefully make us all better mathematicians later. <coughs> I'm done, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, a couple more questions? Right. <laughs> well, but I mean, was, wasn't my whole point that, like, I, I don't actually care about the trust issues? <laughs> yeah, I, no, it, it's a good question. Um, I mean, different of these languages have sort of larger or smaller sort of surface area that you need to trust. Um, and if you care about those things, maybe you should choose a language that has a small, a small core that you, need to, that you need to look at yourself if you really believe. And all the rest is just sort of helper stuff that doesn't, could never... Uh, taint the proof. Um, but yeah, I, I just want help. I don't, I don't care if it's right or not. I know it's right already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, so far, I think nearly everything that's been. There, I think there are kind of two choices. There are the sort of the low level one where you just take one system's logic and do a, an embedding of that entire logic into the, into the other system, and then just have like a, a machine that translates things over. And that works, and there are examples of people doing that. 
um, in between in a bunch of pairs of these things. What you give up there is that you can never touch again the stuff that was done in the other language. Like it's been translated into some impenetrable goop that you can't read or write or do anything with. It proves the theorem, but it's meaningless now. And I think the only other alternative is to um, basically do it at, back at our level and think about using controlled natural languages that are close enough to English that humans can better use them, but that are simple enough that the computer can understand them and, and both read them and write them itself, and then do translations via very high-level controlled natural language. I, as far as I'm aware, that second path, there aren't really convincing examples of it actually having been done, but maybe in the long run it's, it's more useful. Sounds hard to me. <laughs> All right. Let's thanks start again. Thanks. Thank you.